Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'll start. Um, I guess we get, we jump right in. I mean, obviously, yeah. a mid year. You started mid year in this role last year, but it was quite a quite a busy mid year. <laughs> quite a bit happening. I guess do you get the chance to unwind? I guess what the excitement level now for you coming into I guess the first full academic year as uh, in the new role. Well, it's just great having the student athletes back. The other day, uh, Sunday night, night before the first classes, we had a Fear of the Spear games and brought them all back, had a picnic, get them all together, had contest in between each sport. Uh, women's volleyball won, but it was great just to see them together. They hadn't been together in a while and just really welcome them back uh, to campus and their, and their home and had all the coaches there and, and the fellowship that was going around and how happy everyone was to see each other. And that really just kicks off the start of the school year this year and all the things we have planned and the soccer just gotten back from their win against Georgia. So they were able to make it out that night and, and uh, welcome them and congratulate them on a win. So it's just exciting times and you just feel the energy, not only in athletics on campus uh, with the students coming back. So we're excited for the new year. You've been around for a couple of football seasons now, but what's your excitement level heading into your first as AD? Well, Jerry, when you look back and you see, being here two years, going into my third season, you've seen the progression. And I, I say this phrase, but we look the part um, than we did two years ago. And to see what he's building and to see the values he's putting into the organization and just how excited the kids are uh, about the direction of the program. And, and that's what's fun to sit back and evaluate and watch uh, and do both. Um, I attend a lot of practices, as y'all know, for 10, 15 minutes. And a lot of that's just because I want to read uh, the reaction of the students, uh, the student athletes, and see what kind of day they're having on the practice field or court or whatever practice it is, and just really get a feel for how the program's going. And right now, you just feel the energy, as you did at the end of last season as well. You felt the momentum going into this off season and going into uh, spring practice and then going into the start of fall, just how exciting it is. As a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. you get to see Mike Norvell every day. Every day. You see you know, his level of energy, his organizational skills, how his team functions, his internal team. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are all important in what makes a, a, a coach successful or not. Correct. Um, what are your observations about him in that respect? Well, he, he builds a great culture, and he really brings in the, the right student athletes that fit his program and really fit our department and the university as well. But uh, kids with high character, the coaches he hires have very high character, um, the support staff around him are people of high character. And the culture that he's building, and, and I talk about core values a lot, but um, not to be cliche but he is really putting in great core values that I believe for long-term success you have to have. Not short, hopefully we have great short-term success this year, but long-term we're building this thing for the long-term and, and, and a program that can sustain consistency. And that's what's exciting to watch. Kind of along those lines, I mean, obviously it is a, a critical year. I think year three is often a year where you see programs really take that step forward in a lot of cases. What have you seen, you talked about a little bit, just from being out at practice as much as you have to lead you to believe this right. will kind of be that team that looks ready to take the next step, do you think it might? Well, I go back and we look the part. You know, we're, we're looking like a Florida State team. We're executing a little better. Uh, not only look the part on the field, but physically uh, we look the part. And uh, just seeing the execution of this team, seeing it grow, um, you got to remember two years ago, we were the youngest team in football. Last year, we were once again, two years in a row, the youngest team in football. And you look at our roster right now, other than some senior leadership that's very important that we have, I mean, we're young again. Uh, we'll, we, we have a, probably about 80% of our starters back after this season. And uh, so that's what's exciting to see the program getting built um, of the way he's building it for, for the long. I know there'll be some changes to Doug Campbell Stadium this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what can the fans expect? Uh, well, bringing in Legends as a concessionaire. Um, we'll get more power, more outlets. 71-year-old uh, stadium, you know, when we first started looking at it, we only had about 200 points of sale. 
and now we're trying to get up to that 600. Not quite there yet, uh, still drawing power <laughs> from all over campus to different parts of the stadium, but we're, we're gonna get it there in the next year up uh, to 600 points or so in a stadium. And a stadium this size, that, that's what it needs. But I think you're gonna see the amenities. Um, they've now taken over the uh, premium spaces, so you're gonna see an upgrade there in my viewpoint. And uh, that's what's exciting, just the fan experience that we're able to provide um, our fans and constituents who travel. And that you've heard me say it before, we leave the country and 60% of our fan base travels over three and a half hours. I mean, we, we have to provide that experience not only to keep them coming, but also for the impact that we have on the community as a whole financially. Uh, so we, it's up to us to have that fan base continue to want to come to Doak and have an enjoyable time. And that's what we're taking little steps every day to work on that. I know uh, right now the, the uh, hot button issue obviously is the state of conferences and all that with more teams on the move. I know we- Teams we, are moving. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Phillips, I know, talked at ACC kickoff and mm -hmm. I know regularly talks to all the ADs on a, on a call. I guess what is his message right now to, to y'all just about, I mean, how you're kind of doing everything in your power to, to stay competitive in what's kind of, seems like it's rapidly changing. Yeah, you know, and that's the, the million dollar question. Um, and I talked to Commissioner Phillips, he's actually coming in for the game on Saturday. You know, and the ACC has been very successful. Uh, won more national championships than any other conference last year. Uh, looking at how we're doing and our football programs across the league getting better. But, you know, they need Florida State to be good. And that's something I openly talk about in meetings. Um, and we need Miami to be good. It's something we openly talk about in meetings. Because when you look at the TV numbers, the brands still carry a lot of weight. Uh, if you look at it, over the last 10 years, we're still carried a higher viewership than any other program in our conference. So we need to be good uh, to help the conference propel itself. Um, so we talk about that openly. Um, we're looking at various ways we can change some of our revenue streams. You've heard me talk about what we got to do to Doak uh, to change, because right now we're about 13 million behind the average, average SEC team in stadium revenues. We're about 10 million behind the average Big Ten team in stadium revenues. So we need to address that uh, because that's a part of what we can control uh, as a fan base and as a university that can, that can help cut that gap even a little bit more on what you bring in revenue. So we're looking at various models. Um, our new concessions contract is really helping us on the revenue side of things. So we're addressing it not only internally, but then also talking to the conference about how, what we're doing as a conference wide to help narrow that gap. Switching gears to another favorite project. Okay. The, I love projects. Hard hats and dust. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> you know about your walks around campus. <laughs> the football operations facility. Mm -hmm. You uh, projected maybe breaking ground on that by December. Mm -hmm. Are you still uh, thinking that's a realistic goal? Yes, sir. Right now we're, we're still on track. We, I have a meeting tomorrow on it. Um, I'm, I'm very involved in that process, as you know, and and fundraising is going extremely well. Got a nice another seven-figure gift the other day for it. And uh, we're really excited about the what and work with Coach Norvell on it, you know, every day. And it, it's a must for our program. Uh, for us to get back to the elite of college football, we, we need a facility to not only attract student athletes, but then also develop them while they're here uh, in the proper way and the high tech way. Um, so we're real excited about it, and, and it's moving right along. I know uh, with that, Populous has made quite a few visits, I guess, is the blueprint or the uh, plan finalized or is that still kind of being worked on right up until December? Uh, yeah, still being worked on. It's, I mean, we're right now, we're in the in design phase where we're looking at what we're gonna take out, what we need and, and doing some of those edits uh, through, through the process, but we, we're still on track. That, that is all part of the moving it forward. Let me, uh clarify that when we talk about the football operations building we're not talking about blueprint no. right <laughs> sorry threw yes, me off yes. threw me off no, a little bit there it was a, a bad choice of words but. it's okay yeah you you referred to the blueprint of the football correct operations. correct like is correct. the plan for how it's going to be laid correct. out yes yeah the, the it's all built um laid out right now we're just going through right now and seeing what kind of cost savings we can do in the building uh which is standard practice
And what are you at? What was the, I guess, what is the current projected total for that? And what are you at pledged and, and like we're, we're a little bit over 60 million uh, right now and have about another 30 in asks uh, out there that we're, we're going through the process of trying to, trying to secure those pledges as well. But also so part of the revenue, part of the performa that we're gonna build comes out of the stadium to help fund the facility. Um, so it's gonna fund both projects so that's part of the performa that kind of combines both of them. So let's talk about that, mm -hmm. the stadium project, and that's where Blueprint money can be, yeah. be involved. Um, well, not only not on the revenue side, just on the maintenance. Just on the, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure needs. Yeah, infrastructure needs. Um, where are you at on the project itself in mm -hmm. terms of, I know you've, been, you've sold the, the, the owner suites mm -hmm. and the uh, loge suites. Yes, we have sold the owner suites, sold them out, sold the loge boxes, uh, Founders Loge, uh, sold those out. So we have raised in construction capital, uh, part of it, two different we got commitments there, and then construction capital gifts as well. So construction capital gifts are about $44.8 million. Uh, that we have pledged towards the project. Now, next we have to go in and and look at club seats and how we're going to do that, and then look at the south end zone uh, would be the next project. But we're we're still going through the process, which will kind of go this fall uh, when people are back here on campus for games to really look at and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, so those will be starting up real soon. But right now we're on pace. Everything's going well. Uh, the, res the people have been very receptive uh, when we show them what, what we're building um, and what experiences they're going to have. The, they've been extremely receptive to that. Let me be more specific about mm -hmm. blueprint money. We know it's for infrastructure mm -hmm. only. And that's things like you have to replace the, the septic system sewage. ADA issues. ADA. Uh, it's a 71-year-old building. Right. Um, lighting issues, um, ramps. Uh, going in are, are not equipped for today's standards right. uh, that go into the bombs. Uh, looking at bathroom plumbing, looking at the, the steel beams up above. Uh, there's a couple steel beams that need addressing. And um, so it, it's going for the infrastructure and ADA right. uh, opportunities that we need to fix. Can, can you start to use that blueprint money uh, ahead of the yes. 2020? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll start to identify with uh, our, our partners and working with um, downtown as well to identify what, what is getting done and, and what timeline. We won't, don't want to disrupt the season. A lot right. of things we have to do will disrupt this season. So right now we're looking at some, some elements that we can do during uh, weeks that we're not playing, uh, to, uh, small projects to go and address those and then address the major projects later down the road. Well, that do you, what timeline do you envision for the actual seating structure to be modified? Seating structure, we're looking to modify right now 25, 26 season. We're told we can fix, um, go in and implement everything we're trying to do in one off season. Uh, yeah. by the, they said they built Texas A&M in one off season so that they can do our project in one off season. So um, right now we're hoping for the 25 season. If everything, It's on pace for that if everything stays on target. How, uh, how far down? I know part of that was kind of talking to everyone first, kind of the people affected mm -hmm. and then work your way down the priority list. I guess how far down have you have you made it now, especially on, mm -hmm. I'm sure this fall will be big for that as well. This, this fall will be big. We're, right now we've gone through 110 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, now now's when, when all the affected and club seat holders in the south side and anyone who's impacted uh, will be having those conversations. So now's when the, the, the robust conversations uh, and speed of various people um, will begin happening. We'll start having, I mean, I'm going through this several times elsewhere. I mean, there's some days you're having 50 meetings a day um, in the preview center um, because it's just the, the volume that we're about to get into with our fan base. Kurt, do you have any other questions about the stadium or I'm gonna to jump to NIL? Yeah, we can jump. <laughs> you know what, <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> So, uh, you chaired uh, a, mm -hmm. a group of athletic directors to address the issues of mm -hmm. NIL. Yes, sir. Long before it was mm -hmm. released. Uh, over two and a half years ago, we started that process. 
I'm actually going to be in D.C. September, 1st of September, uh, meeting with some congressmen uh, regarding NIL's couple of bills going in front of the in front of Congress, and and they want my feedback on them, and we'll just I'll we'll be over there just seeing seeing some congressmen and talking to them about how great Florida State is, and also addressing some NIL questions that they have. So I have a lot of questions about this, but we'll make them brief. One is, you know, when you started this process, mm -hmm. uh, to where we are today, right? Um, How has it evolved? It, you know, to be honest with you, uh, it, it's kind of evolved the way I thought it would, um, and, and that's the one hundred percent honesty. Because when we went in and presented guardrails uh, to the NCAA and, and modeled it, how it would work, and and really looked at fair market value for, for arrangements and having to go through a checks and balances system, uh, much like the NFLPA. Uh, I, I really, uh, our group took the NFLPA from my experience and that and some others and really collegialized it <laughs> a little bit is uh, the way I like to put it. But um, and when the NCAA said, you know, well, we don't know if that would work. Um, we're gonna roll the dice kind of and, and uh, go about it a different way. Um, it's, going, it's, it's going the way I thought it would. Uh, you're gonna have a wild west. Um, I do believe water always levels. I do believe that the market always corrects itself. Uh, and I've said that from day one. I think after year one, um, you're gonna go to year two and it's gonna look a little different uh, out there. Um, so year three will be a little different. And, then eventually it'll just be part of what what the collegiate landscape is, and that's it's. I'll never forget when people thought cost of attendance uh, would destroy college athletics, and it's just part of what we do. It's just part of, it. and the, the NIO will be the same way. Title um, nine, title nine, view the, uh, the same way. View the same way. It's it's just part of um, how we're going to be conducting business uh, moving forward. Let me ask a follow-up on that. When you say the, the NFL PA, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a union mm -hmm. with, with, and arbitration. And, uh, but we would still go out in their marketing arrangements and, and work. Uh, so if you work for an organization, uh, and I use Port Jason Witten all the time to get uh, in my analysis and, and Romo. Um, but if I, when I did the Albertsons deal for Witten, I would work with him and his agent on what his fair market value was to be a representative of that organization uh, throughout Texas. Um, when we worked with, with Tony and his agent on his starter deal, what does that look like and how does that impact um, his name, image, and likeness and how does it impact the relationship with the organization? So you did it as an organization um, and modeling it after what contracts go to the NFLPA um, so they can take a look at it. And then they would measure for a fair market value so you'd have three different, or sometimes four different organizations uh, measure that and say, okay, that deal for Tony Romo is worth this uh, because they, they're measuring everything. It's the same organizations that would tell me uh, what Toby McGuire is worth to do a movie. <laughs> I mean, they measure and go in and look at social media and, and their impact and even performance and put it all in um, and tell you what the fair market value is. We take the middle one and go work out the arrangement but that's that's how it was done um, we did them all the time everything from a, a big one like that down to uh, let's say a cornerback that's not well known going to a local uh, chain of brew pubs in Dallas I mean so it was it was all around the board um, but you'd send them and get the fair market value for that particular athlete I know your and plenty of people's long-term hopes with NIL is kind of the uniformity, obviously, across that oh, doesn't exist please. now, where <laughs> some states the schools can get involved and here and, yeah. and plenty of other states they can't. Do you have a preference? Would you think schools should all be able to be involved? Should should all not be involved? Or just you just want uniformity one way or the other? Yeah, uniformity one way or the other. Um, you know, we, right now under this state law, we can't be involved, and we're not. Um, but. You know, at the end of the day, you want what's best for the, the student athlete. Uh, we have a great Apex program. We try to educate them on their rights. Uh, great partnership with the entrepreneurship school on campus, Moran Entrepreneurship. 
uh, the business school comes in or teaches some, some classes that our athletes and regular students can attend um, to understand their brand. And that was something that was very important to me that not only athletes, but um, a student also needs to be able to come in and understand that if they want to work for a corporation one day, that they need to understand how to brand themselves uh, just as valuable as a student athlete possibly. Um, so it's, we do a great job of education, but once we educate our student athletes on the rights and particular interest of how to go about conducting that business, uh, then we, we kind of step out of the way uh, because that's the state law at this moment. I guess tangentially related, I, I can ask, I know in the last few years, uh, a new, was a new NCAA rule paved the path where they can do the, is it financial incentives for a certain GPA for student athletes? Austin. Hmm? Uh, Austin. Case. Yes. Yes. Um, is that something you've explored doing here? I know. I don't think you Florida State was among the first uh, like ACC schools or, or right. Power Five schools to do it. We are uh, participating in Austin uh, this year for our student athletes, and uh, very. I think it's a great thing for them um, to be able to come in and, and get performance for academic achievements, and uh, so we, we will be participating in Austin. You've added some new staff. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to share with us, uh, tell us a little bit about your staff and what they bring? Uh, we'll start uh, with new Deputy Director of External, uh, Janine Lollick. Um, you know, just being able to get her and her wealth of experience, you know, from the private sector uh, of 18 years as IMG, ISP, and then she was at Fanatics and Ticketmaster and just being able to come in, she's negotiated every media deal there was on the and that experience with the NIL space uh, from her days at, at IMG. So just be able to get her expertise here, uh, especially where we think the future of college athletics is heading, uh, as we've just discussed, um, to be able to get her expertise here to help help assist me and, and use her experience to do what's the best thing for Florida State, make sure we're set up with the right processes and procedures to have success and forecast the future of college athletics. Uh, then to get Lisa here, Vera Tamitas, um, you know, an ex-coach, uh, ex-player, Division One athlete, uh, ex-Division One coach, volleyball, and just be able to get her to come in, the relationship she builds with not only our student athletes, but across campus as our new senior women's administrator, is just gonna be very beneficial to some of the the core things we're trying to get accomplished and culture things we're trying to get accomplished with the, the leadership academy that our student athletes are going to go through and our student athlete development office and making sure we're doing the right things there, educating our student athletes on Title IX and everything that, and partnering with campus to make sure we're doing all the right things is her experience is going to be second to none. So I couldn't be more proud of, of being able to get those two to join our staff here at Florida State. You've worked in sports at quite a few different stops, quite a few different areas. What's the importance of, I mean, both of them being women, having that representation among administrators <laughs> in sports? You know, I didn't even know it. Somebody with uh, um, reached out to me and goes, you know, you, your whole senior staff is almost all women. I said, well, I go home to all women every day. And I, uh, <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time. <laughs> Maybe that's that was just in my subconscious. Uh, no, I, I really want to look for the most qualified. Uh, and Lisa and then Janine and her experience, her qualifications uh, are second to none in this business. Um, someone who has unbelievable contacts and reach, uh, not only in the college space, professional space, and the private sector space. Um, you know, when she calls, people are gonna return her call uh, because of the respect that the industry has for her. Um, and the same with Lisa as well. A lot of respect for what she's accomplished in her career. So just being able to get them to join us uh, it really setting us up for the future here, and that's what's exciting. We can, uh, I guess, talk about a few other new coaches on on staff as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one season already underway. We knew the uh, the shoes Coach Penske had to fill. I guess how right. impressed have you been with how he's handled? I mean, obviously getting here late compared to right. when the previous season ended, but how he's hit the ground running with that team. He has. He, you know, he's he's really developed an authentic relationship with the team and. And it's fun, fun style to watch him play against Georgia and South Carolina, and to get that win, and uh, see the aggressive approach uh, that the team's taken uh, offensively is is something I'm enjoying. And 
um, you know, he, he's just doing a great job. His personality is second to none. He and his wife are going to be great additions to this community, and we couldn't be more thrilled to have him uh, here. At, your, at the introductory press conference for baseball coach Link Jarrett, you talked about building a stadium around him. Mm -hmm. um, so how are those talks with Link gone? And has he been here long enough to really oh, get yeah. an assessment? We talk all the time. Uh, and, you know, it's we've, we've addressed the field. You know, we, we started last year with addressing some things inside the field uh, that I thought needed to get done. Um, then we addressed the grass and, and wanted his opinion on what he wanted uh, as a playing surface. Um, able to do that, uh, for let him get in, take a look at it, and we're addressing that. We're addressing some of the some of the fan amenities um, within the stadium, um, looking at some of the practice areas that need addressing, looking at locker room, team room, um, and starting to build a, a project list. For baseball because you know at the end of the day this is Florida State baseball and we, we shouldn't be second to anyone and and just making sure he has the resources uh, to go out and win a national championship and, and that Florida State baseball deserves and that's what's exciting to see his vision of, of what he wants out of the program and, and really eye to, he and I are eye to eye on, on what needs to be done and, and just working together on is there a timeline on some of those? I mean, are some you can do immediately? Yeah, some we can do immediately. Of course, the field we're doing immediately, we're looking at addressing some of the fan amenities, concourses, telling our story immediately. Um, we're addressing the turf and the practice area immediately. And then with that, we're looking at, okay, now now what do we do next? Um, the locker room needs to be addressed. It's pretty, uh, pretty out, old, uh, outdated. So do we build a new facility? So we're having people look at it. Do we build a new locker room that connects to this facility, maybe turn an old locker room into a premium space in the dugout. So we'll get we're getting some different different looks from some sports architects to give us some concepts, and that's what we're excited. We've actually done three studies on it, and kind of taken from each one that we've done in the past, and see and kind of combining them to see what can be successful, and getting his thoughts on all those. So we're addressing some immediate needs right now, but also looking what we're going to do long term over the next few years. So he'll maybe announcing some of that stuff in the lead up to his first season? Hopefully. Uh, still got a lot of work to do, but hopefully. I think that's, uh, that's everything. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Always enjoy meeting with you two guys. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool.